Chris Preble is back with us this week to drive this foreign policy disaster we've been cooking up into the 20th century. Chris is the Cato Institute's Vice President for Defense and Foreign Policy Studies. He's the author of The Power Problem, John F. Kennedy and the Missile Gap, and his latest book, this one from libertarianism.org, Peace, War, and Liberty, Understanding U.S. Foreign Policy. Welcome to Liberty Chronicles, a project of libertarianism.org. I'm Anthony Comegna. We left off last week with uh, selections from William Graham Sumner that, of course, you can find the, the full document on libertarianism.org. But I want to pick up right back there uh, so we can finish out the Sumner document and get a, a sense of his full argument and the full scope of the, the history that he's trying to draw upon and, and really the, – the, I mean he's, he's projecting his sense of history into the future too and saying, look, look what you're, you're running headlong into. So let's pick up right there and tell us uh, – remind us what Sumner's argument is and what he believes the risks are uh, if the American sure. people charge headlong into, into the, the path of Spain. The path of Spain. So, so as I said in, in, last week, the, what frustrated Sumner and, and really – again, there's a, there's a real tone of anger in the speech but a, but a sort of useful anger um, that – that people believe that the United States is going to become great by emulating the behavior of past empires and that's how you know that's the path to greatness is that you become an empire you lord over other people you you assume responsibility um, and you grow the state this was one of his great concerns and as it was with the founders um, and I think one of the themes that comes through um, and again is so resonant today is that he, is he reminded people that this country, this polity, we had certain rules and there were in fact limits to what we could do. We would bump up against reality fairly quickly, right? If we, and, and he reminded people of the challenges that, were, that existed right here. He's speaking at New Haven, in New Haven, Connecticut. He points to the problems of, of corruption uh, right there in the city. He points to the problem of, of, of racism, you know, rampant racism and lynchings in the South and, and, and elsewhere in the United States. States and he says, "Gee, we have problems here at home, and we think that we're, you know, d does this imply that we've solved all these problems, and therefore we are in a perfect position to go solving other people's problems?" Um, one of my favorite lines you'll, you'll, you'll read from this is is about, you know, trusting in luck and cleverness, and we'll charge into a hole, and that's, and then, you know, being great believe, is, is about believing that no matter what hole you get yourself into, being great means getting out of it, uh, what you'll be able to get out of it, and, and to which he basically says, no, how about we don't go into the hole in the first place? <laughs> Get America out of the hole again. It doesn't, doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't sound have the same so good. Thing, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, how did the war against Spain turn out? And what what did the campaign against the Filipino insurrectionaries look like? Because right. you know, right? I, I know the final numbers are somewhere around three hundred thousand dead, right? Something like that. Although again, the statistics are sort of a, a little, you know, as you can imagine, sort of hard to come by. I mean, the numbers of Americans killed um, in the suppression of the Filipino insurrection was far, far greater than what was suffered against the war with Spain. The war with Spain actually happened, you know, ended fairly quickly, um, but there was resistance. There was violent resistance to in it, to U.S. rule. And what is striking to me about this episode um, is. A sense among a few, although sadly only a few, um, American officers, senior officers, and some American politicians who even with all of the horrible acts that have been perpetrated against the Native Americans as, as in the second half of the 19th century, they looked upon what the United States Army in particular was doing to the to the Filipinos and they said, this is far worse than anything we ever did here. We are, we are uh, undermining this institution um, and, uh, and they saw it sort of having a, an effect that would, that would reach into other American institutions. The power of the executive branch, the president himself expanded dramatically 
because there was a governor appointed by the president to lord over the Filipinos. That was an, an uh, you know a power that that was invested uh, uh, in the executive branch with virtually no oversight by Congress. And so it was one of these episodes in American history where uh, the 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 power of the army grew. Uh, it was less susceptible or less uh, transparent, um, and and it became, of course. Uh, if anyone were to question uh, the conduct of the uh, the counterinsurgency against the the Filipinos, if anyone was to question that, it was treasonous. These were people that had taken up arms against American troops, and how dare you question uh, what is being done in in your name? Uh, and and many of the imperialists were were really very. Um, um, just unabashed about on this point. It's like you can criticize us after the war is over, is basically what their message was. Everywhere you go on the continent of Europe, at this hour, you see the conflict between militarism and industrialism. You see the expansion of industrial power pushed forward by the energy, hope, and thrift of men. And you see the development arrested, diverted, crippled, and defeated by measures which are dictated by military considerations. At the same time, the press is loaded down with discussions about political economy, political philosophy, and social policy. They are discussing poverty, labor, socialism, charity, reform, and social ideals, and are boasting of enlightenment and progress, at the same time that the things which are done are dictated by none of these considerations, but only by military interests. It is militarism which is eating up all the products of science and art, defeating the energy of the population and wasting its savings. It is militarism which forbids the people to give their attention to the problems of their own welfare, and to give their strength to the education and comfort of their children. It is militarism which is combating the grand efforts of science and art to ameliorate the struggle for existence. The American people believe that they have a free country, and we are treated to grandiloquent speeches about our flag and our reputation for freedom and enlightenment. The common opinion is that we have these things because we have chosen and adopted them, because they are in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. We suppose, therefore, that we're sure to keep them, and that the follies of other people are things which we can hear about with complacency. People say that this country is like no other, that its prosperity proves its exceptionality, and so on. These are popular errors in which in time will meet with harsh correction. The United States is in a protected situation. It's easy to have equality where land is abundant and where the population is small. It's easy to have prosperity where a few men have a great continent to exploit. It's easy to have liberty when you have no dangerous neighbors and when the struggle for existence is easy. There are no severe penalties under such circumstances for political mistakes. Democracy is not then a thing to be nursed and defended, as it is in an old country like France. It is rooted and founded in the economic circumstances of the country. The orators and constitution makers do not make democracy. They are made by it. This protected position, however, is sure to pass away. As the country fills up with population, and the task of getting a living out of the ground becomes more difficult, the struggle for existence will become harder and the competition of life more severe. Then liberty and democracy will cost something if they are to be maintained. Now what will hasten the day when our present advantages will wear out, and when we shall come down to the conditions of the older and densely populated nations? The answer is war, debt, taxation, diplomacy, a grand governmental system, pomp, glory, a big army and navy, lavish expenditures, political jobbery, in a word, imperialism. In the old days, the democratic masses of this country, who knew little about our modern doctrines of social philosophy, had a sound instinct on these matters, and it is no small ground of political disquietude to see it decline. They resisted every appeal to their vanity in the way of pomp and glory which they knew must be paid for. They dreaded a public debt and a standing army. They were narrow-minded and went too far with these notions, but they were at least right if they wanted to strengthen democracy. The great foe of democracy now and in the near future is plutocracy. Every year that passes, brings out this antagonism more distinctly. It is said to be the social war of the 20th century. In that war, militarism, expansion, and imperialism will all favor plutocracy. In the first place, war and expansion will favor jobbery, both in the dependencies and at home. 
In the second place, they will take away the attention of the people from what the plutocrats are doing. In the third place, they will cause large expenditures of the people's money, the return for which will not go into the treasury, but into the hands of a few schemers. In the fourth place, they will call for a large public debt and taxes, and these things especially tend to make men unequal, because any social burdens bear more heavily on the weak than on the strong, and so make the weak weaker and the strong stronger. Therefore, expansion and imperialism are a grand onslaught on democracy. Another answer which the imperialists make is that Americans can do anything. They say that they do not shrink from responsibilities. They are willing to run into a hole trusting to luck and cleverness to get out. There are some things that Americans cannot do. Americans cannot make 2 plus 2 equal 5, so far as yet appears. Americans cannot govern a city of 100,000 inhabitants so as to get comfort and convenience in at a low cost and without jobbery. The fire department of this city is now demoralized by political jobbery, and Spain and all her possessions are not worth as much to you and me as the efficiency of the fire department of New Haven. The Americans in Connecticut cannot abolish the rotten borough system. The English abolished their rotten borough system 70 years ago, in spite of nobles and landlords. We cannot abolish ours in spite of the small towns. Americans cannot reform the pension list. Its abuses are rooted in the methods of democratic self-government, and no one dares to touch them. It is very doubtful, indeed, if Americans can keep up an army of 100,000 men in time of peace. Where can 100,000 men be found in this country who are willing to spend their lives as soldiers? Or, if they are found, what pay will it require to induce them to take this career? Americans cannot disentangle their currency from the confusion into which it was thrown by the Civil War, and they cannot put it on a simple, sure, and sound basis which would give stability to the business of the country. This is a political impossibility. Americans cannot assure the suffrage to Negroes throughout the United States. They have tried it for 30 years now, and contemporaneously with this war with Spain, it has been finally demonstrated that it's a failure. Inasmuch as the Negro is now out of fashion, no further attempt to accomplish this purpose will be made. It's an impossibility on account of the complexity of our system of state and federal government. If I had time to do so, I could go back over the history of Negro suffrage and show you how curbstone arguments, exactly analogous to the arguments about expansion, were used to favor it, and how objections were thrust aside in the same blustering and senseless manner in which objections to imperialism are met. The ballot, we were told, was an educator and would solve all difficulties in its own path as by magic. Worse still, Americans cannot assure life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness to Negroes inside of the United States. When the Negro postmaster's house was set on fire in the night in South Carolina, and not only he but his wife and children were murdered as they came out, and when, moreover, this incident passed without legal investigation or punishment, it was a bad omen for the extension of liberty, etc., to malaise and tangles by simply setting over them the American flag. Upon a little serious examination, the offhand disposal of an important question of policy by the declaration that Americans can do anything proves to be only a silly piece of bombast, and upon a little reflection, we find that our hands are quite full at home of problems by the solution of which the peace and happiness of the American people could be greatly increased. The laws of nature and of human nature are just as valid for Americans as for anybody else. And if we commit acts, we shall have to take consequences just like other people. That is the great fundamental cause of what I've tried to show throughout this lecture that we cannot govern dependencies consistently with our political system, and that, if we try it, the state which our fathers founded will suffer a reaction which will transform it into another empire, just after the fashion of all the old ones. That is what imperialism means. That is what it will be. And the democratic republic, which has been, will stand in history, like the colonial organization of earlier days, as a mere transition in form. And yet this scheme of a republic which our fathers formed was a glorious dream which demands more than a word of respect and affection before it passes away. Indeed, it's not fair to call it a dream or even an ideal. It was a possibility which was within our reach if we had been wise enough to grasp and hold it.
It was favored by our comparative isolation, or at least by our distance from other strong states. The men who came here were able to throw off all the trammels of tradition and established doctrine. They went out into a wilderness, it is true, but they took with them all the art, science, and literature which up to that time civilization had produced. They could not, it is true, strip their minds of the ideas which they had inherited, but in time, as they lived on in the new world, they sifted and selected these ideas retaining what they chose. Of the old world institutions, also they selected and adopted what they chose and threw aside the rest. It was a grand opportunity to be thus able to strip off all the follies and errors which they had inherited so far as they chose to do so. They had unlimited land with no feudal restrictions to hinder them in the use of it. Their idea was that they would never allow any of the social and political abuses of the old world to grow up here. There should be no manners, no barons, no ranks, no prelates, no idle classes, no paupers, no disinherited ones except the vicious. There were to be no armies except a militia, which would have no functions but those of police. They would have no cord and no pomp, no orders or ribbons or decorations or titles. They would have no public debt. They repudiated with scorn the notion that a public debt is a public blessing. If debt was incurred in war, it was to be paid in peace and not entailed on posterity. There was to be no grand diplomacy, because they intended to mind their own business and not be involved in any of the intrigues to which European statesmen were accustomed. There was to be no balance of power and no reason of state to cost the life and happiness of citizens. The only part of the Monroe Doctrine, which is valid, was their determination that the social and political systems of Europe should not be extended over any part of the American continent, lest people who were weaker than we should lose the opportunity which the new continent gave them to escape from those systems if they wanted to. Our fathers would have an economical government, even if grand people called it a parsimonious one, and taxes should be no greater than were absolutely necessary to pay for such a government. The citizen was to keep all the rest of his earnings and use them as he thought best for the happiness of himself and his family. He was, above all, to be ensured peace and quiet while he pursued his honest industry and obeyed the laws. No adventurous policies of conquest or ambition such as in the belief of our fathers, kings, and nobles had forced for their own advantage on European states would ever be undertaken by a free democratic republic. Therefore, the citizen here would never be forced to leave his family or to give his sons to shed blood for glory and to leave widows and orphans in misery for nothing. Justice and law were to reign in the midst of simplicity, and a government which had little to do was to offer little field for ambition. In a society where industry, frugality, and prudence were honored, it was believed that the vices of wealth would never flourish. We know that these beliefs, hopes, and intentions have been only partially fulfilled. We know that, as time has gone on and we have grown numerous and rich, some of these things have proved impossible ideals, incompatible with a large and flourishing society. But it is by virtue of this conception of a commonwealth that the United States has stood for something unique and grand in the history of mankind, and that its people have been happy. It is by virtue of these ideals that we have been isolated, isolated in a position which the other nations of the earth have observed in silent envy. And yet there are people who are boasting of their patriotism, because they say that we have taken our place now amongst the nations of the earth by virtue of this war. My patriotism is of the kind which is outraged by the notion that the United States never was a great nation, until in a petty three months campaign it knocked to pieces a poor, decrepit, bankrupt old state like Spain. To hold such an opinion as that is to abandon all American standards, to put shame and scorn on all that our ancestors try to build up here, and to go over to the standards of which Spain is a representative. So then tell me about how Sumner's prediction started playing out, that the U.S. would be dragged just like Spain into conflict after conflict with some some god godforsaken part of the globe. They would be fighting for, for territory. Right. Uh, what kinds of interventions followed the Spanish-American War? Well, the, the early interventions in the early 20th century were mostly in – our hemisphere. And again, there was some pattern for this going back even before the Spanish-American War. 
but you had, you know, you had a intervention back into Cuba. You had interventions in Haiti, in Mexico, in the Dominican, what we now know as the Dominican Republic. Um, so there were there were these episodes throughout the the nineteen uh, teens and nineteen twenties uh, where the United States was behaving in its hemisphere a lot like any other European power would. Of course, we reserved for ourselves under the Roosevelt corollary to the Monroe Doctrine, we reserved for ourselves this right that we had effectively, you know, effectively kicked the British or anyone else out of this hemisphere. And now it was our job to do what they used to do to, to recalcitrant uh, uh, indigenous, pe indigenous peoples and natives here. Um, so I do think that's where you see uh, the early flowering of a, of to the extent that American empire and imperialism existed, uh, that's that's really was was its heyday. Now I have to I have to hasten to add that compared to we talked about the Belgians before we talked about others compared to them it does not on that same scale, um, and and there was always this tension. There was always this resistance. There were always Americans like Sumner um, and the Anti-Imperialist League who was active at the time of the Spanish-American War and what came after. They were there to say, no, this is not what we do. This is not who we are. And, and you don't have that same sort of resistance, it seems to me, uh, uh, among the other sort of mature empires and imperialists who, who had a more, um, shall we say, um, uh, old-fashioned view of such things. Yeah, you know, it it strikes me that perhaps we're not <laughs> we're not the worst actors out <laughs> yes, there, right? right? Like right. you know, unquestionably uh, the US military has not murdered as many people as, you know, the the Chinese right. or the <laughs> well, Germans right, yeah. or, mm -hmm. you know, also recently. Yeah, like, mm, right. Know, yeah. Un unquestionably, yeah. if if you add up these things, I mean, Genghis Khan had pyramids of skulls right, right, built. Like right. there there are far That's worse. That's a pretty low bar though, so yeah. Yeah, yeah right. Yeah, well, yeah. sure, but but yeah. we're also talking about a truly global empire like none has ever existed too. Correct. Right. And it, it operates quite differently. Yes. Uh, it, it it kind of has to than, you know, some ancient land empire like the like the Mongols. Mm -hmm. Um but nonetheless, we do seem because because we're so powerful and globe spanning and wealthy and everything else and headstrong, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, we we might not be the worst around, but we do get in there and mess things up just at the right time. Right. <laughs> Which leads me to discussion of the world wars. Right. Right. Especially something like World War One, where I think lots and lots of libertarians make the case that our intervention really pushed it over the edge to, to set up a nasty peace with Germany and all the problems we get leading to World War II. And we're not responsible for the Holocaust by any stretch of the imagination. No, no. But we, oh man, did we just get in there at the wrong time and think we could boss history around. Right. Uh, well, of course, we were a late entry to World War I. It was going on for several years. And, but, you know, Woodrow Wilson was determined for the United States to be, as I say, you know, this participating in the war, uh, even fairly late in the game, as you say, did tip the scales. Um, uh, what had happened in Russia and, and the Bolshevik Revolution also had a key impact on the course of World War I. But, but that act on Wilson's part to get the United States involved in World War I bought the United States a place at the big kid's table. At least he thought it did. Um, but but his, you know, his famous 14 points and his sort of high-minded principles, the, the rationales that he used to justify American entry certainly didn't play out very well um, as far, you know, as far as the people of, for example, the Middle East were concerned, as the European powers were carving up the Ottoman Empire. Um, where were those principles? The United States uh, barely registered at all. Um, and I also think that that our that our history and our our recollection of the eight, of the 1920s, excuse me, the 1920s and the 1930s, and sort of the United States having been involved in World War One, but not being present, as far as most people are concerned, not really being present, and certainly not a dominant player in the 1920s and 1930s, was um, a sort of tragic missed opportunity for the United States. That's how many people interpret it. I, I don't know that that's entirely accurate, um, but I do think that that the lessons that we took away from the interwar period between World Wars I and II definitely informed the conduct of U.S. foreign policy coming out of World War II. Now, one of the other things that Sumner was very concerned about that particularly interests me about, about uh, his essay is that uh, 
he says that Americans are likely to get swept up into all of these dangerous European intellectual and political movements mm -hmm. at, at the time, uh, this great conflict between military, industrial, capital and uh, – right plutocracy yes. and the forces of republicanism and democracy and socialism and communism and all of these horrible uh, uh, cleavages in European life that create ca catastrophic, you know, Napoleonic type wars and right. revolutions of 1848 and all this, all this wild madness from the old world was, was going to infiltrate our society too. Mm -hmm. um, to what extent did Americans start getting sucked into these kinds of ideas and movements as a result of their foreign policy? Well, I think if you look at the way the United States mobilized resources for World War I in particular, the Spanish-American War was so short that it really doesn't have the same character. But by the time of World War I and the, the corporatism that, the, and the cronyism that, 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 uh, that occurred uh, because of the need to rapidly, very rapidly, uh, build up the U.S. military um, and sort of the early stages of the regimentation of the American economy and the and the, again it was a very collaborative uh, relationship between uh, between corporate interests and businesses and the government. Uh, but again, because U.S. involvement was relatively short, I think we should look at World War One as sort of a testing ground for World War Two and the way that that war was was. Um, uh, the mobilization that occurred for World War II because, of course, that one was much longer, much larger and the United States started building up for World War II even before we enter World War II because we were arming the the, uh, the main belligerents, uh, uh, Britain, Britain and then eventually Russia before our entry, Soviet Union. Um, I think that the, it, that was an aspect of uh, sort of going back to Washington's farewell address about the his warning against having a permanent armaments industry and having a relationship between American business and the federal government in which businesses became dependent upon the manufacture of weapons of war. That was what was different about the United States and he wanted it always to be different. And what had occurred, as you point out, in many, in many European countries is because there was there were vested business interests that benefited from making weapons for um, uh, for for fighting um, that they became very influential politically now of course this was heavily this was hotly debated in the United States in the 1920s and 1930s the sense you know the famous merchants of death or infamous merchants of death and then people who believed that they were the ones who impelled or sort of drew the United States into into the war I think that's been I think that's a little oversimplified to say the least but I think that the concern that um, a uh, if you have a uh, an entire uh, corporate class that it, that benefits from warfare, uh, that's the part that I think uh, going all the way back to the founders would recognize. That's the danger of upsetting this balance between uh, what is necessary for American security and what ultimately undermines American security. Now, as as you mentioned earlier, it is important to to uh, point out that. Both world wars had their major detractors, uh, and even, you know, back to the Spanish-American War, there was an important anti-imperial movement, uh, an anti-war movement. Um, you, Eugene Debs ran for yes president from prison from prison, uh, right? <laughs> thanks to uh, his his seditious speeches, uh, which discouraged conscription. By the way, what uh, I didn't raise my boy to be a soldier was the most popular song of 1914. Right. Uh, and Teddy Roosevelt, if I remember correctly, said something like the the women who sang it should should go to the Middle East and join a harem. They they would do more service to their society. Uh, <laughs> I don't remember that comment, but <laughs> yeah, it's good to know. So yeah, yeah, lots about Teddy. Uh, so, what, could you say a bit about uh, the? The content and character of the anti-war movement uh, throughout the scope of the two sure. world wars and then what happens to it 
after sure. World War II? That's a, that's a really great question. So um, the, writing this book allowed me, sort of gave me an excuse to go back into some Ted Galen Carpenter's work on the free speech and the press over the over the course of human of American history and and especially looking at the the um, the attempts to stifle stifle dissent in World Wars One and World War Two. Um, I guess one of my per- personal favorites is the the film producer uh, who was thrown in jail uh, for making a film in World War One about the about the American Revolution uh, because it portrayed our British allies in World War One in an unhappy light. Um, you know those those sorts of things, um, and you know this. But this is precisely this is a, a theme that I talk about throughout the book um, that. When a country is mobilized for warfare, um, dissent is um, is dangerous, right? And it, in, and even people who are ge- who are generally inclined to believe in individual liberty and inclined to believe in the in the importance of speech as a fundamental human right, um, even they are cowed during times of war. Um, and one of the ways I like to frame it is, you, you know, in World War II. And you have, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, at the high point, about 14 million, most nearly all men in arms at the high point of World War II, um, two thirds to three quarters of whom were conscripted, right? But they, they're they serving in the military. So you, if you're in that situation and you're on the home front, to to speak out against the war when a neighbor has had, you know, a son killed in combat uh, is is a is a really it's sort of a, a fraught enterprise, right? You just, it's, people don't want to be in that position. And that's one of the things about warfare is it just drains away this sense of individualism. Now, sometimes for perfectly good reason, because if the war is necessary to sustain the society, then that's the whole, that's the whole point. But I think many times that's not the case. And of course you do have the, the, the worst abuses. There were, there were, there was persecution of uh, German Americans in World War I. Uh, and of course, famously, infamously, the uh, Japanese Americans Americans in World War II. So the worst abuses against human rights uh, and individual liberties in the United States uh, do occur during times of war. And and I think the war, the anti-war movement, as you say, was was less uh, vocal in World War II than in World War I, perhaps because the sense of threat uh, and the sense of actual actual threat to national security was pro- was was more acute for, cer- for certain in World War II than in World War I. I think it was harder for Americans to see what was going on in Europe in World War I as a threat to the United States, whereas what was happening in World War II, I think, uh, looked much more, more like uh, a danger to the United States itself, not simply a case of the United States having to play with the big boys in order to be considered part of the part of the club. God knows how accurate this statistic is, but I've at least uh, heard it claimed by reputable historians on the history of slavery that uh, World War II was the height of slavery and forced labor in world history. Right. And it's not just conscripted soldiers either, like a, glib- a libertarian, I almost said almost said glibertarian, libertarian, yeah. but a glib libertarian might well uh, say conscription counts as slavery and I would agree with that. Uh, and forced but, labor, obviously forced labor was used in World War II for you know many horrible reasons by many people and things like that. Sure. Yeah, exactly. So much production for war material and, and uh, uh, people drained from the colonies that were still around and things like that, that uh, it's just massive and we, f- we forget the costs of, of things like that. Uh, because I think we tend to look at war as something purely that happens from above. You know, our leaders tell us what it's about and what it's for, and we just go off and fight it and do our duty and serve right. the nation, and right. manifest destiny. And now, I was I was going to ask that with with the outcome involved in both world wars, though, it seems pretty justifiable that Americans would come out of it feeling like they had fulfilled manifest destiny or at least the first couple of stages. Right. Uh, Who knows when the first was completed, but this seems like stage two or three complete and we can move on to the next. And, uh, you know, here they are. They smashed uh, Nazism in in Germany. They they, uh, destroyed Japanese imperialism and, and, and tore apart two massive continental empires. They're bidding defiance to the Soviet juggernaut. 
that's you know trying to paint the world red, and <laughs> they just developed nuclear weapons. They you know are are pioneering science and starting to send rockets off into space. Right. So, I mean this this does seem pretty exceptional right. for, in, in world history. And I yeah. mean, the only other examples that I could come up with quickly are the things that historians call the gunpowder empires, mm -hmm. like like the, the Mughal Empire or mm -hmm. right. Tamerlane and uh, even somebody like Genghis Khan who didn't have the benefit of gunpowder, but he had plenty of quick horses. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's this intensely swift rise to global power, uh, immense subjugation of native peoples, the absolute imposition of, of totally new systems of government there and and you end up with this giant land empire serving as the basis for sort of global conquests, mm -hmm. right? It's not a terribly charitable interpretation to compare the US to, to something like Tamerlane's empire. Right. But uh, you know, I wonder if you could say something about the, the fact that this seems like it really is an exceptional case. Well, I think it's an exceptional case for a couple of reasons. First of all, the United States uh, emerged from World War II um, so strong on so many levels um, because, well, frankly, uh, we were not uh, – the war was not fought on our shores, on our soil, right? So we did not suffer – the United States did not suffer the kind of uh, grinding, grueling warfare that occurred throughout most of Europe and of course the Soviet Union lost something on the order of you know over 30 million people were you know were killed in World War II in the Soviet Union. Um, so our emergence from World War II as the dominant power in the world was both a function of our ability to mobilize enormous amounts of, of military power um, quickly, but also our ability to emerge from the war reasonably unscathed, again, for, aside from the several hundred thousand who were killed in action. Um, and that allowed us, it seems to me, to put us in a very strong position vis-a-vis -vis the traditional European empires, France and, and and Great Britain, um, who were, you know, who had their colonies peeled away from them or slip away from them in the in the post-war period, but then, uh, meanwhile, we of course bumped up against the Soviet Union, which was was uh, grievously wounded by World War II, but also emerged uh, in a stronger position because um, they were able to consolidate control over um, Eastern Europe and their, you know, the great adversary, Germany, was, was, was carved in half. So th that set up the, the you know, the post-war period was so, was so brief because we immediately, you know, within a very short period of time, several years, moved into the Cold War, uh, and that's, that's what defined uh, U.S. foreign policy, of course, for several decades after that. Now, I think if if you <laughs> if libertarians had to choose their favorite twentieth century president, mm -hmm. uh, certainly their favorite would not come from the twentieth century. I feel that that's pretty confident in that. But if they had to choose one from the twentieth century, it might well be Eisenhower. Yes, probably specifically because of his farewell address. Yes, and the warnings against the military-industrial complex. Now, the document we have though from Eisenhower. Uh, is not his farewell address, the, the more famous speech of, of his, his most famous speech. Uh, tell, us, tell us about this other speech we have from Eisenhower. The Chance for Peace. The Chance for Peace speech was given in April of 1953. This is one of his first speeches as president. Um, and what is um, remarkable about this speech is the, his ability to, in very personal terms, explain to the American people the opportunity it costs, the opportunity costs associated with maintaining a vast military arsenal to compete with the Soviet Union. He was giving the speech, Joseph Stalin had only recently died and there was some hope on his part that the new leaders in the Soviet Union uh, would not be locked into this armed competition with the United States and he hoped that they would seize this, as the speech says, chance for peace. But he warned that if they did not and the, and the world remain locked in an armed competition that that we would be poorer for it because we would be spending less money on the things that actually make our lives better and more money on the things that are dedicated simply to uh, fighting and winning wars. 
And I mean, again, we have to remember what, who this man was, where he came from. He spent his entire adult life um, in the military, in the United States Army, went to West Point, served in, you know, in various sta stages, ultimately a five-star general, you know, essentially the, the leading military figure um, in the United States coming out of World War II. Um, and so no one could doubt this man's sort of military prowess and his understanding of things military. But what's remarkable about the speech is that he never forgot that the United States was comprised of people who were not in the military, in spite of the fact that that's, the, that's really all he knew. Um, and, and that's why I love the speech. And I think in many respects, you, as, as well known as the farewell address address is as 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 well known as that speech is i almost wish that wish that this speech was as well known and perhaps with our with our efforts here we'll sort of move it in that direction here here i like i like that idea and you know uh, i i'm glad you said that bit about about eisenhower's experience because i uh, tell me if you have a better suggestion but it doesn't seem to me <laughs> like anyone on the planet at the time literally would have been as well informed about these subjects as Eisenhower, especially no. when you come to the farewell address talking about the military industrial complex right. at the end of his two terms in office. Right. No one on the planet is as well informed about the confluence of these issues as Dwight. I think that's right. I, I think that's right. I think there were people in, you know, there was, there could have been some interesting figures emerging from the Soviet Union and <laughs> so could have said similar things to, to, to Eisenhower. Some paperclip people maybe. Well, no, I mean like <laughs> like uh, Marshall Zukov, somebody like that, you know, who was a, a war hero but also had concerns about sort of the abuses of the political class. And so he would have been the kind of person, which is precisely why the political class was determined to keep him down. But um, – that that sort of thing, but I think that Eisenhower, um, be, be, the farewell address, having seen this play out over the course of two presidential terms, and 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 almost a daily struggle on his part to to maintain a semblance of balance between the needs for the military and the needs for national security, and the equally urgent needs to build the country at home, and just constantly trying to strike that balance. And I think a real sense, a tone in the farewell address. A, a tone of um, of disappointment, of a sense that he had had tried and failed. I say this, and I mean it very sincerely, for a number of reasons. Not the least of these is the number of friends I am honored to count among you. Over the years, we have seen, talked, agreed, and argued uh, with one another on a vast variety of subjects, under circumstances no less varied. We have met at home and in distant lands. We have been together at times when war seemed endless, at times when peace seemed near, at times when peace seemed to have eluded us again. We have met in times of battle, both military and electoral, and all these occasions mean to me memories of enduring friendships. I am happy to be here for another reason. This occasion calls for my first formal address to the American people since assuming the office of the presidency just 12 weeks ago. It is fitting, I think, that I speak to you, the editors of America. You are, in such a vital way, both representatives of and responsible to the people of our country. In great part, upon you, upon your intelligence, your integrity, your devotion to the ideals of freedom and justice themselves, depend the understanding and the knowledge with which our people must meet the facts of 20th century life. Without such understanding and knowledge, our people would be incapable of promoting justice. Without them, they would be incapable of defending freedom. Finally, I am happy to be here at this time before this audience because I must speak of that issue that comes first of all in the hearts and minds of all of us. That issue which most urgently challenges and summons the wisdom and the courage of our whole people. This issue is peace. In this spring of 1953, the free world weighs one question above all others, the chances for a just peace for all people. To weigh this chance is to summon instantly to mind another recent moment of great decision. It came with that yet more hopeful spring of 1945, bright with the promise of victory 
and of freedom. The hopes of all just men in that moment, too, was a just and lasting peace. The eight years that have passed have seen that hope waver, grow dim, and almost die. And the shadow of fear, again, has darkly lengthened across the world. Today, the hope of free men remains stubborn and brave, but it is sternly disciplined by experience. It shuns not only all crude counsel of despair, but also the self-deceit of easy illusion. It weighs the chances for peace with sure, clear knowledge of what happened to the vain hopes of 1945. In that spring of victory, the soldiers of the Western Allies met the soldiers of Russia in the center of Europe. They were triumphant comrades in arms. Their people shared the joyous prospect of building, in honor of their dead, the only fitting monument, an age of just peace. All these war-weary peoples shared, too, this concrete, decent purpose, to guard vigilantly against the domination ever again of any part of the world by a single, unbridled, aggressive power. This common purpose lasted an instant and perished. The nations of the world divided to follow two distinct roads, the United States and our valued friends, the other free nations, chose one road. The leaders of the Soviet Union chose another. The way chosen by the United States was plainly marked by a few clear precepts which govern its conduct in world affairs. First, no people on earth can be held as a people to be an enemy. For all humanity shares the common hunger for peace and fellowship and justice. Second, no nation's security and well-being can be lastingly achieved in isolation, but only in effective cooperation with fellow nations. Third, every nation's right to a form of government and an economic system of its own choosing is inalienable. Fourth, any nation's attempt to dictate to other nations their form of government is indefensible. And fifth, a nation's hope of lasting peace cannot be firmly based upon any race in armament, but rather upon just relations and honest understanding with all other nations. In the light of these principles, the citizens of the United States define the way they propose to follow through the aftermath of, peace, of war toward true peace. This way was faithful to the spirit that inspired the United Nations to prohibit strife, to relieve tensions, to banish fears. This way was to control and to reduce armaments. This way was to allow all nations to devote their energies and resources to the great and good task of healing the war's wounds, of clothing and feeding and housing the needy of perfecting a just political life, of enjoying the fruits of their own toil. The Soviet government held a vastly different vision of the future. In the world of its design, security was to be found not in mutual trust and mutual aid, but in force. Huge army, subversion, rule of neighbor nations. The goal was power superiority at all costs. Security was to be sought by denying it to all others. The result has been tragic for the world and for the Soviet Union. It has also been ironic. The amassing of Soviet power alerted free nations to a new danger of aggression. It compelled them in self-defense to spend unprecedented money and energy for armaments. It forced them to develop weapons of war, now capable of inflicting instant and terrible punishment upon any aggressor. It instilled in the free nations, and let none doubt this, 
the unshakable conviction that as long as there persists a threat to freedom, they must, at any cost, remain armed, strong, and ready for the risk of war. It It inspired them, and let none doubt this, to attain a unity of purpose and will beyond the power of propaganda or pressure to break now or ever. There remains, however, one thing essentially unchanged and unaffected by Soviet conduct. This unchanged thing was the readiness of the free world to welcome sincerely any genuine evidence of peaceful purpose, enabling all peoples again to resume their common quest of just peace. And the free world still holds to that purpose. <laughs> the free nations, most solemnly and repeatedly, have assured the Soviet Union that their firm association has never had any aggressive purpose whatsoever. Soviet leaders, however, have seemed to persuade themselves or tried to persuade their people otherwise. And so it has come to pass that the Soviet Union itself has shared and suffered the very fears it has fostered in the rest of the world. This has been the way of life, forged by eight years of fear and force. What can the world, or any nation in it, hope for if no turning is found on this dread road? The worst to be feared and the best to be expected can be simply stated. The worst is atomic war. The best would be this, a life of perpetual fear and tension a burden of arms draining the wealth and labor of all people, a wasting of strength that defies the American system or the Soviet system or any system to achieve true abundance and happiness for the people of this earth. Every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies, in the final sense, a theft from those who hunger and are not fed those who are cold and are not clothed. This world in arms is not spending money alone. It is spending the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, the hopes of its children. The cost of one modern heavy bomber is this, a modern brick school in more than 30 cities. It is two electric power plants each serving a town of 60,000 population. It is two fine, fully equipped hospitals. It is some 50 miles of concrete pavement. We pay for a single fighter plane with a half million bushels of wheat. We pay for a single destroyer with new homes that could have housed more than 8,000 people. This is, I repeat, the best way of life to be found on the road the world has been taking. This is not a way of life at all, in any true sense. Under the cloud of threatening war, it is humanity hanging from a cross of iron. These plain and cruel truths define the peril and point the hope that come with the spring of 1953. This is one of those times in the affairs of nations when the gravest choices must be made if there is to be a turning toward a just and lasting peace. It is a moment that calls upon the governments of the world to speak their intentions with simplicity and with honesty. It calls upon them to answer the question that stirs the hearts of all sane men. Is there no other way the world may live? The world knows that an era ended with the death of Joseph Stalin. The extraordinary 30-year span of his rule saw the Soviet Empire expand to reach from the Baltic Sea to the Sea of Japan, finally to dominate 800 million souls. 
Soviet system shaped by Stalin and his predecessors was born of one world war. It survived with stubborn and often amazing courage, the Second World War. It has lived to threaten the Third. Now a new leadership has assumed power in the Soviet Union. Its links to the past, however strong, cannot bind it completely. Its future is, in great part, its own to make. This new leadership confronts a free world aroused, as rarely in its history, by the will to stay free. The free world knows, out of the bitter wisdom of experience, that vigilance and sacrifice are the price of liberty. It knows that the peace and defense of Western Europe imperatively demand the unity of purpose and action made possible by the North Atlantic Treaty Organization embracing a European defense community. It knows that Western Germany deserves to be a free and equal partner in this community, and that this, for Germany, the only safe way to, fulfill, to full final unity. It knows that aggression in Korea and in Southeast Asia are threats to the whole free community to be met only through united action. This is the kind of free world which the new Soviet leadership confronts. It is a world that demands and expects the fullest respect, respect of its rights and interests. It is a world that will always accord the same respect to all others. So the new Soviet leadership now has a precious opportunity to awaken with the rest of the world to the point of peril reached and to help turn the tide of history. Will it do this? We do not yet know. Recent statements and gestures of Soviet leaders give some evidence that they may recognize this critical moment. We welcome every honest act of peace. We care nothing for mere rhetoric. We care only for sincerity of peaceful purpose, attested by deeds. The opportunities for such deeds are many. The performance of a great number of them waits upon no complex protocol, but only upon the simple will to do them. Even a few of such clear and specific acts, such as Soviet Union's signature upon an Austrian treaty, or its release of thousands of prisoners still held from World War II, would be impressive signs of sincere intent. They would carry a power of persuasion not to be matched by any amount of oratory. This we do know. A world that begins to witness the rebirth of trust among nations can find its way to a peace that is neither partial nor punitive. With all who will work in good faith towards such a peace, we are ready with renewed resolve to strive to redeem the near lost hope of our day. The first great step along this way, along this way must be the conclusion of an honorable armistice in Korea. This means the immediate cessation of hostilities and the prompt initiation of political discussions leading to the holding of free elections in a united Korea. It should mean, no less importantly, an end to the direct and indirect attacks upon the security of Indochina and Malaya. Well, for any armistice in Korea that merely released aggressive armies to attack elsewhere would be a fraud. We seek throughout Asia as throughout the world a peace that is true and total. Out of this can grow a still wider task, the achieving of just political settlements for the other serious and specific issues between the free world and the Soviet Union. None of these issues, great or small, is insoluble, given only the will to respect the rights of all nations. 
Again we say, the United States is ready to assume its just part. We have already done all within our power to speed conclusion of a treaty with Austria, which will free that country from economic exploitation and from occupation by foreign troops. We are ready not only to press forward with the present plans for closer unity of the nations of Western Europe, but also upon that foundation to strive to foster a broader European community, conducive to the free movement of persons, of trade, and of ideas. This community would include a free and united Germany with a government based upon free and secret ballot. This free community and the full independence of the East European nations could mean the end of the present unnatural division of Europe. As progress in all these areas strengthens world trust, we could proceed concurrently with the next great work, the reduction of the burden of armament now weighing upon the world. To this end, we would welcome and enter in the most solemn agreement. These could properly include, one, the limitation by absolute numbers or by an agreed international ratio of the sizes of the military and security forces of all nations. Two, a commitment by all nations to set an agreed limit upon that proportion of total production of certain strategic materials to be devoted to military purposes. Three, international control of atomic energy to promote its use for peaceful purposes only and to ensure the prohibition of atomic weapons. Four, a limitation or prohibition of other categories of weapons of great destruction. Five, the enforcement of all these agreed limitations and prohibitions by adequate safeguards, including a practical system of inspection under the United Nations. The details of such disarmament programs are manifestly critical and complex. Neither the United States nor any other nation can properly claim to possess a perfect, immutable formula. But the formula matters less than the faith, the good faith without which no formula can work justly and effectively. The fruit of success in all these tasks would present the world with the greatest task and the greatest opportunity of all. It is this. The dedication of the energies, the resources, and the imaginations of all peaceful nations to a new kind of war. This would be a declared total war, not upon any human enemy, but upon the brute forces of poverty and need. The peace we seek, founded upon a decent trust and cooperative effort among nations, can be fortified, not by weapons of war, but by wheat and by cotton, by milk and by wool, by meat and timber and rice. These are words that translate into every language on earth. These are the needs that challenge this world in arms. This idea of a just and peaceful world is not new or strange to us. It inspired the people of the United States to initiate the European Recovery Program in 1947. That program was prepared to treat with equal concern the needs of Eastern and Western Europe. We are prepared to reaffirm with the most concrete evidence our readiness to help build a world in which all peoples can be productive and prosperous. This government is ready to ask its people to join with all nations in devoting a substantial percentage of any savings achieved by real disarmament to a fund for world aid and reconstruction. The purpose of this great work would be to help other peoples to develop the undeveloped areas of the world, to stimulate profitable and fair world trade, to assist all people to know the blessing of productive freedom. The monuments to this new war would be roads and schools, hospitals and homes, food and health. 
We are ready, in short, to dedicate our strength to serving the needs rather than the fears of the world. I know of nothing I can add to make plainer the sincere purposes of the United States. I know of no course other than that marked by these and similar actions that can be called the highway of peace. I know of only one question upon which progress waits. It is this. What is the Soviet Union ready to do? Whatever the answer is, let it be plainly spoken. Again we say the hunger for peace is too great, the hour in history too late, for any government to mock men's hopes with mere words and promises and gestures. Is the new leadership of the Soviet Union prepared to use its decisive influence in the communist world, including control of the flow of arms, to bring not merely an expedient truce in Korea, but genuine peace in Asia? Is it prepared to allow other nations, including those in Eastern Europe, the free choice of their own form of government? Is it prepared to act in concert with others upon serious disarmament proposals? If not, where then is the concrete evidence of the Soviet Union's concern for peace? There is before all peoples a precious chance to turn the black tide of events. If we fail to strive to seize this chance, the judgment of future ages will be harsh and just. If we strive but fail and the world remains armed against itself, it at least be divided, will need be divided no longer in its clear knowledge of who has condemned humankind to this fate. The purpose of the United States in stating these proposals is simple. These proposals spring, without ulterior motive or political passion, from our calm conviction that the hunger for peace is in the hearts of all people, those of Russia and of China, no, le no less than of our own country. They conform to our firm faith that God created man to enjoy, not destroy, the fruits of the earth and of their own toil. They aspire to this, the lifting from the backs and from the hearts of men of their burden of arms and of fear, so that they may find before them a golden age of freedom and of peace. Thank you. So tell us how it worked out then. Uh, what, what does the fallout for the Cold War have to teach us about the chance for peace that we might have now? I think that the fallout from the Cold War was most obvious within a few years of the Cold War's end. So you you know if you're if you're like me, you know I was I was so so in 1989 I graduated from college, was commissioned in the Navy and then that year saw the Berlin Wall come down. So everything that I had been planning to do as a midshipman in a Navy ROTC unit and in my early days as a naval officer were supposed to be about fighting the Soviet Union and and I can attest to the fact that in the summer of 1989 and even into the spring of 1990 the Soviet Union and Russia was still there. They were still out there. The Navy was out there. They were doing things that looked like that what they were doing during the Cold War. But once it was clear that the Soviet Union was gone and that Russia wasn't going to be the Soviet Union, once it was obvious that the Cold War really was over, we could have actually revisited the purpose of American military power asked the question of why were we organized for a globe, uh, you know, uh, uh, globe straddling, globe, globe girdling, whatever term you want to use, uh, uh, military infrastructure deployed in hundreds of bases around the world. We could have 
revisited that, and we, ultimately we chose not to. Ultimately, the United States, U.S. leaders, George Bush 41, and then and then Bill Clinton, um, determined that the United States would retain a substantial share of its military power, uh, and it would continue on the trajectory that was established during the Cold War, even though that Cold War adversary was gone. Um, and I think that's the part of this story that Eisenhower uh, would look upon and and say that his warning about the military industrial complex was proved true when the adversary that that complex that was created to, to fight in the 1950s uh, was gone and yet the, the infrastructure remained. You know, I, I remember the great Bob Higgs one time saying that he, he – when he was – Growing up and and uh, in his in his adulthood through most of it uh, in the Cold War, he couldn't imagine a better adversary for you know the military industrial complex than the Soviet Union, the big right. bad Soviet Union that needs right. all these. They were big you know, and they were bad battleships yes, and bombs yes, and yeah. stuff to to fight them. But then came the terrorists, right? Right. And the terrorist is even better because they could be anywhere. They could be anywhere. They could be hiding behind the curtains in the studio. Correct. Here, they right? might be there right now. And so yes, we need yes. to put cameras there right. behind the Everywhere. curtain. Everywhere, yes. And outside yes. the curtain and under the table just to be safe. And Lockheed will make them all right. And uh, at <laughs> yes. inflated prices. Right. And, uh, and that's an even better adversary. If, if your real goal is not a secure country – but if your real goal is, you know, to to fatten up, uh, it's true. Some, There's no there is corporate masters. Then that's that's an even better. Enemy. There is no limit, and and the spending isn't done merely by the federal government. The spending is done by everybody, right? That's because it's all about this this danger that's lurking, uh, um, this this spooky foreign ish danger. But the foreign ish danger might just be a. Uh, you know, a, a radicalized uh, uh, lone wolf right here in the United States. We see this play out uh, over and over again, tragically, since 9-11, um, that um, the kinds of um, intrusive measures, the kinds of costs that we have tolerated in this country uh, go well beyond uh, the, what we did during the Cold War. Yes, there was a Red Scare. Yes, there were people who were persecuted for you know their their uh, their you know, dubious loyalties to various actors. And yet, I think it's absolutely true that the the harms to liberty here in this country um, uh, since uh, the start of the war on terror uh, certainly compare and arguably are worse than what we suffered during the Cold War. Now, I know you're going to be on uh, Free Thoughts to yes. talk about the second part of your book, which is more about the libertarian philosophy or, or approach to foreign policy. But I do want to get an idea from you of what we do about this now. Where do we go now? Because I'm a left libertarian, anarchist, radical sort of person and uh, honestly, old Ike Eisenhower's vision sounds pretty good. You right. know, it sounds pretty good. So where where do we go from here? Well, I think that even libertarians, maybe maybe <laughs> maybe not you, Anthony, but my, my, this libertarian, me speaking just for myself, believe that the United States should have a military and we should have a military to defend us from harm. But the military we have is far larger than we need to keep us safe, and that is a problem. This goes back to the, some themes I've been working on for many years of my life. That large and active and expansive military spread around the world gets itself into lots of gets itself into lots of trouble, and it does not. Uh, behoove us as a nation, and it's particularly, I think, wrong to put American soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, etc., into harm's way if we don't have a clear sense of what it is we're asking them to do and why we're asking them to do it. And the nature of U.S. foreign policy today is to reach for that military hammer far too often. We see our power as a country, we see our influence as a country uh, manifested as as a military thing, as our ability to fight and win wars. But there's so much much more of American power and influence that are so much more important than that. And we have to recapture those things. We need to we need to reinvest in the importance of cultural exchange through mutually beneficial trade and uh, you know all those things, as well as diplomacy. Diplomacy has sort of fallen in bad odor for some reason. I just don't really understand it. Uh, but the notion that the United States should interact with other countries peacefully, voluntarily as much as possible, we don't need to apologize for that. We shouldn't apologize for that. Um, we understand 
coming out of World War II, you talked, we talked about this a few minutes ago, coming out of World War II, it was pl- completely understandable why the United States, why the American people believed that the U.S. military was this incredible instrument of good because it did some amazing things in World War II. And it achieved at, at cost and, and, you know, uh, it achieved some things that looked um, uh, unprecedented in human history. But what really makes this country great and what I think still could make this country great is all of the other things that we Americans do in the world that are not by violence at all, but that are done by that are done peacefully, that are done voluntarily, um, and I think we need to. I need to. I think we need to recapture that as a country and to understand that our influence doesn't come mostly um, from what it is that we ask our military to do. Once again, our greatest thanks to Chris Preble for joining us the past two weeks and for taking on such a mammoth subject. I don't know the relative level of radicalism out there among you, audience. But I really do feel confident in saying that the chance for peace sounds like a chance worth taking for all of us before it's too late. Thanks for listening. Liberty Chronicles is produced by Tess Terrible. If you enjoy Liberty Chronicles, please subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. If you'd like to learn more about libertarianism, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.com. Dot org.